Goldman Sachs is just plain evil. They are evil as can be. Goldman Sachs are such a liar. They say one and one makes three. When the funds they sold their junk to tanked, they went on a spree. Goldman Sachs is just plain evil. They are evil as can be. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Corbett Report podcast. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan here on the 17th day of November, 2017. Welcome to episode 315 of the Corbett Report. Meet Goldman Sachs, Vampire Squid. And as that cheerful little ditty from Joe Crow Ryan, appropriately entitled Goldman Sachs is Evil, amply demonstrates... In our post-Lehman, post-subprime, post-bankster bailout world, Goldman Sachs is a synonym for evil. Max, if I could start with you, I mean, what is it about Goldman Sachs? How does it manage to, to turn the figures around like that? Well, Goldman Sachs are scum. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, they basically have co-opted the uh, U.S. government. They've co-opted the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve functionality. Uh, they've co-opted the Obama administration. Barack Obama, uh, you know, dances to Goldman Sachs tune. And they are really crooked and abominable in what they've done. Whose agenda or what agenda is it that the CIA is carrying out? And it seems like it would be particularly with the remarks you've just made, it would be the agenda of, of say, Wall Street, let's say, the big bang. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Goldman Sachs. If you want to know what this, who the CIA works for, look at Goldman Sachs. Another pathological. Uh, if you look at people like David Rockefeller or uh, the chairman of, of Goldman Sachs or the chairman of uh, Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan Chase, these are psychopaths. These are people without any emotions whatsoever. So what do you guys think about Goldman Sachs? I think they're vampires. I think they are draining resources from this country. And they're one of the reasons why this country is going downhill. So this is, this is Goldman Sachs. One of the most evil corporations in human history. But as with any other piece of received wisdom, we run the risk of this mantra of Goldman Sachs is evil becoming simply that, simply a mantra that can be repeated without really understanding the history or the significance of that phrase. And that process of sloganization of the Goldman Sachs is evil mantra was aided along in no small part by Matt Taibbi of Rolling Stone, who infamously or famously in 2009 declared the bank to be a vampire squid, which of course is where we take the title of today's podcast. More specifically, in his article on the Great American Bubble Machine, Tybee wrote colorfully and memorably that the world's most powerful investment bank is a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Now, that is obviously very inventive, colorful writing that sticks in the, uh, the audience's mind and certainly hits home in that regard, but people can often see the pyrotechnic fireworks of a sentence like that and disregard the actual history that, uh, that makes a sentence like that powerful and poignant. So, in order to counteract that sloganization of Goldman Sachs is evil, we can start by rolling out the greatest hits, as it were, of the Goldman Sachs bubble machine that has been involved in perpetuating or participating in or fostering or even creating scandals and crises over the many, many, many decades of its existence starting perhaps with the Great Crash of 1929, aided along in no small part by Goldman Sachs with its Shenandoah and Blue Ridge Trust scandal. And, and by the way, my, my Buzz Flash book of the month from, as I recall, three months ago, maybe it was two months ago, in any case, a couple months ago, was uh, by... by um, by John Kenneth Galbraith, Galbraith, the uh, famous economist who recently died. It was called The Great Crash, 1929. And it was originally written in, in the 1950s, and then he updated it back, I don't know, about eight, nine years ago. And he was absolutely prescient in that book, predicting the next crash, which is why it's such a brilliant book. 
But there's an entire chapter in that book called In Goldman We Trust about how Goldman Sachs basically created, did the great crash of 1929. And they did it through this, through this uh, series of, of shell companies. They basically, they, they, they created what they called the Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation. And they sold shares in this trading court. It was like, it was back in that day, it was the equivalent of a mutual fund. You know, you can buy into a mutual fund now and it's like, you know, somebody's m managing a bunch of stuff. It was sold sort of like a mutual fund. And they sold their shares. They issued shares at $100 a piece. They bought all of their shares with their own money. And then they sold 90% of them at $104 each to the public. And the public snapped them up. So they made a profit on the initial sale of their own stock, of their own company. And then they started, since they, they kept 10% of the shares, they, they started buying back their own shares, which drove up the price of their shares. That company then spun off a new company called the Shenandoah Corporation, issuing millions of shares in that fund. And the Shenandoah Co Corporation then sh then issued, created another company called the Blue Ridge Corporation and issued millions of shares in that fund. And people all over America were buying these funds. And in fact, there's some people, you know, those who are old enough to remember the Great Depression, I'm certainly not one of them. Uh, you, you know, you'd have to go back to my grandfather for that. But but uh, people refer to that as the Shenandoah crash sometimes, or the Blue Ridge crash. More investment trust securities were offered in September of 1929, even than in August. The total was above $600 million. However, the nearly simultaneous promotion of Shenandoah and Blue Ridge was to stand as the pinnacle of new era finance. It's difficult not to marvel at the imagination which was implicit in this gargantuan insanity. If there must be madness, something may be said for having it on a heroic scale. Years later, on a gray dawn in Washington, the following colloquy occurred before a committee of the United States Senate. Senator Cousins Did Goldman Sachs and Company organize the Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation? Mr. Sachs. Yes, sir. Senator Cousins. And it sold its stock to the public? Mr. Sachs. A portion of it. The firm invested originally in 10% of the entire issue for the sum of $10 million. And the other 90% was sold to the public? Yes, sir. At what price? At 104. That is the old stock. The stock was split two for one. And what is the price of the stock now? Approximately one and three quarters. Or we could look at Goldman Sachs' role in contributing to the Eurozone meltdown and austerity crisis by helping Greece to cook its books to make some of its debt magically disappear so that it could stay within the boundaries of the Maastricht Treaty and thus a member of the Eurozone. It looks like Greece has been bonding with the wrong crowd. Goldman Sachs is being blamed for designing a complex debt plan that earned them millions, but maybe leaving the country in ruins. Megan Carpenter is a contributor for the Washington Independent. She joins us now from our New York studio. Megan, first we bail out Goldman Sachs. Now there are reports that Goldman Sachs designed a plan to help Greece hide its debt, which could in turn spur another global financial crisis. What is going on here? Well, that's a, a complex question to answer, which I'll try to condense down. In effect, uh, when Greece entered the Eurozone, they fudged some of the numbers about their deficits and continued to pile them up. And Goldman Sachs worked with them in 2005 to design a plan by which they would issue bonds in another currency and use a fake exchange rate to reap more money out of that than they should have, something that they would then be paying off in a couple of years. Now that the debt crisis has intensified in Greece, these numbers are coming to light because 
the statistical agency in the Eurozone has looked into Greece's figures and said, hey, these aren't quite right. And the more they dig in, the more they realize that Greece was more in debt all along than anybody realized except Greece and, it turns out, Goldman Sachs. The thing I want to point out is that for the last few weeks, Europe has just been torn apart. The euro has been was so volatile. All the uh, credit markets have been so volatile around this constantly um, emerging hidden debt. You see so many headlines about Greek, Greece didn't know that they had so many debts. There's 40 billion surprised hidden debt found. Um, they revised up their uh, budget deficit for 2009 from 12.2 percent to 16 percent overnight. So was Goldman Sachs uniquely positioned as the creator of these fictional exchange rate swaps to have positioned themselves? And was this a situation that will emerge in a few years' time that very much like the subprime market? Uh, Goldman Sachs helped create many of the, the collateralized debt obligations on subprime mortgages in America and uniquely profited from it. Yeah, they committed fraud. It's like baseball players taking steroids. Well, this is... You know, the, their involvement in this situation in Greece suggests that they could have another bumper profit year in oh. 2010. Oh, they'll get huge Christmas bonuses again this year for their fraud because a moral hazard in America, and Obama's America means more Christmas bonuses. Naturally, we will have to include in this catalog of horrors Goldman's contribution to the subprime meltdown of the previous decade, resulting, of course, in the Great Recession and the jobless recovery a role for which Goldman Sachs has been found criminally culpable. Where we knew the borrowers were unable or unlikely to pay. Regardless, the housing bubble kept growing. But just in case it burst, Goldman was prepared. It protected itself by betting against the very mortgage-backed securities that it created and sold to investors in the first place. Goldman had protected itself with an exotic Wall Street invention, similar to an insurance policy, that enabled it to bet that people here in Cleveland and elsewhere wouldn't pay their mortgages back. It was a complex financial creation with a name only a banker could love, a synthetic collateralized debt obligation, or synthetic CDO. If the value of the mortgage is held up, Goldman, like any holder of an insurance policy, would continue to make a steady stream of relatively small payments. But if the mortgage market did collapse, Goldman stood to reap a huge reward. There's something wrong with the system that allows a firm to package and sell mortgages to their investors that they know are iffy and collecting fees on the front end for packaging these mortgages and then betting against it on the other end. That is wrong, and they did it. One of those synthetic CDOs that Goldman offered was a deal called Hudson Mezzanine that got the attention of Senator Carl Levin. The $2 billion Hudson synthetic CDO, a Goldman salesperson described it as junk, not to the buyer, of course, but inside. The CDO imploded within two years. Your clients lost. Goldman profited. Here's how Goldman used its Hudson deal to bet against the mortgages it had sold as investments just months earlier. It started with homes like this at 785 Wayside Road in Cleveland. In 2006, Goldman bought the mortgage on this house, pooled it with others, and created a mortgage-backed security that it offered to customers. This empty lot on Wayside is where that home once stood. It turns out Goldman made two deals that included the mortgage for this home in the same year, the mortgage-backed security and the Hudson Synthetic CDO. In the first, Goldman offered an investment to customers who expected the mortgages would be paid back. In Hudson, Goldman was wagering its own money that the mortgages would not be paid back. That raises the question, was the bank selling investments it assumed would go bad? Goldman insists it was not. Quote, we did not choose securities with the belief they would lose value. If investors did not like the underlying securities, they could have chosen not to invest. Craig Broderick heads risk management for Goldman Sachs. The larger takeaway for so many people seems to be that Goldman Sachs knew better than anybody else and gamed the system uh, and knew that the mortgage market was about to collapse and therefore did something that no other firm did. It might uh, enhance my 
profile as a risk manager if I were able to sit here and say we had great uh, uh, insight into how the market was going to move. Goldman officials say the bank lost money investing in residential mortgages. Further proof, they say, that they didn't expect the housing market to collapse. We nearly knew that the market appeared to have more risk inherent in it than we had understood previously. And therefore, the appropriate action was to, uh, was to reduce risk. To reduce its risk, Goldman turned to those Wall Street concoctions, synthetic CDOs. The reason they're called synthetic is because no mortgages are actually bought or sold. A synthetic CDO is simply a wager, a bet on whether mortgages will be paid back. That means Goldman and other banks could create bets on the same mortgages again and again. Along the way, the bad debt just kept multiplying. And as a ghastly but not at all surprising addendum to that story, Goldman Sachs has found a way to make its criminal penalties for its own criminal actions a weapon that it can use to rub salt into the wounds of its own victims. Back in 2008, Goldman Sachs, which was an investment bank, that meant that all their losses were there, was turned into a commercial bank within 24 hours so they could qualify for $10 billion in bailout funds. But as part of the deal, as part of the deal, Amy. And explain commercial bank. Okay, commercial bank is, sub, is the types where you put in your savings and we, and the, we the taxpayers and the government guarantees the, uh, the, uh, the profits or guarantees the solvency of that bank. So for Goldman to get into the 10 billion, to get their $10 billion check for bailout, they had to become, go from a gambling house, an investment bank, into a nice commercial bank. But they had to agree that they would then be subject to what's called the Community Reinvestment Act and return some of that money, a chunk of it. Most banks put in a billion dollars, return a chunk of it back into low income communities. Well, Goldman doesn't have any branches, so they gave money to the designated low-income bank of New York, Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union, and but they've been giving out the money in eyedroppers, like this $5,000. Now remember, it's not a donation. It's a required payment under the law that they got in return for our $10 billion, okay? So it's not a donation. This is mischaracterized. It's a payment required by law with an eyedropper, but what they are doing is starting off something very dangerous and new, which is to say there are literally tens of billions of dollars in these funds for community reinvestment, boosted by the bailout funds. They see this as a political weapon, as a, as a hammer to control the political discussion. These community development credit unions have been joining the Occupy Wall Street movement nationwide. It's about moving your money from the big banks to the small banks. Now, they're not worried about losing little deposits. What they are worried about is losing political control of the discussion. Right now, people like Paul Volcker are calling for um, removing the rights of banks like Goldman, now a commercial bank, to stay in the gambling trading business. Well, Goldman's very much afraid of that. So the Occupy Wall Street movement has put back on the table these issues of bank deregulation, these uh, issues of community reinvestment. And Goldman, I think they're actually quite smart. They figured out, well, we got there's like $100 billion on the table here. Why don't we start saying you're not going to get any of it unless you, unless you uh, uh, dance to our tune? And I have to tell you from inside, it wasn't minor. It wasn't just, oh, take our, uh, give us back our donation money. It was legal threats saying, if you, you cannot, if you're going to get our money, you may not uh, um, back Occupy Wall Street and the Move Your Money movement without getting approval from us at Goldman Sachs. That's a whole new business. So it's, it's very dangerous because it involves billions of dollars in public money. It's not Goldman's money. It's our money. And that's what they're doing with it. But as thoroughly damning as a litany of abuses like that is, it should be stressed that that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the tissue of wanton criminality that permeates the very fabric of Goldman Sachs history. We could look at many, many other examples of scandal and abuse and corruption and criminality from the history of Goldman Sachs. For example, the 1970 bankruptcy of Penn Central, or the 1980s conviction on insider trading charges of Robert Freeman, a protege of Robert Rubin, or we could look at the 2006 food bubble and how it was run up by speculators from Goldman Sachs who were quote-unquote gambling on starvation. 
There are many, many other such examples of abuse and criminality from the history of this investment bank, so I will put links in the show notes for you to explore those above-mentioned scandals, and I would suggest that you continue to look uh, through the history and record for more examples. But I think, perhaps most remarkably for a podcast like this one, it is not the illegal and fraudulent activity that Goldman Sachs has participated in in the past that represents the true, systemic, deeply disturbing threat of a bank like Goldman Sachs. No, it is the legal activities that it engages in that constitutes the real threat here. And in order to understand that, I think we have to go back and understand a little bit about Goldman Sachs and its history. We all know that it is an investment bank, but what does that mean? What does Goldman Sachs do? How does it make its money? Where did it come from and where is it going? Let's start tackling those questions by talking a little bit about the history of Goldman Sachs, where it came from, how it was founded, and the History of the founding of Goldman Sachs in 1869 by Marcus Goldman is one of those stories that is manna from heaven for a uh, a PR department of a large faceless corporate behemoth that is hated by the public because it represents one of those plucky immigrant makes good stories that just goes over so well and includes quaint tales of the history and the birth of this vampire squid. Reading from Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World by William D. Cohan, quote, In 1869, Marcus Goldman moved with his family to New York City. One of the main reasons for the move was that Bertha Goldman had had about as much of Philadelphia as she could stand and urged her husband to move them all north. They settled at 4 West 14th Street. By this time, Goldman had decided to abandon the clothing business, as had a number of his Jewish peers, and decided to do what he could to get into the money business. He started a sole proprietorship at 30 Pine Street, focused on buying and selling IOUs from local businessmen. The idea was to help these small operations turn their accounts receivable into cash without having to make the arduous trip uptown to a bank. Goldman's office was in the cellar of the building, next to a coal chute, and, according to Birmingham, in these dim quarters he installed a stool, a desk, and wizened part-time bookkeeper who worked afternoons for a funeral parlor. The name on the door? Marcus Goldman, banker and broker. Despite the humble office space, Goldman made sure he looked the part of an aristocrat. In what was the standard banker's uniform, tall silk hat and Prince Albert frock coat, Marcus Goldman started off each morning to visit his friends and acquaintances among the wholesale jewelers in Maiden Lane and in the swamp where the hide and leather merchants were located, Birmingham wrote in our crowd. Marcus carried his business in his hat. He knew a merchant's chief need, cash. Since rates on loans from commercial banks were high, One means New York's small merchants had of obtaining cash was to sell their promissory notes or commercial paper to men like Marcus at a discount. In his telling, Birmingham likened the commercial paper of the day, unsecured short-term debts, to a post-dated check that could only be cashed six months in the future. Based on prevailing interest rates and the time value of money concept, the idea that $1 in hand today is worth more than $1 in hand six months from now, because presumably you could invest the money in the interim and earn a return on it, Investors such as Marcus Goldman would buy the IOU for cash at a discount today, knowing that, all things being equal, over time he could get face value for the paper. According to Birmingham, the commercial paper of these small businesses in Lower Manhattan would be discounted at between 8 to 9%. Goldman bought the discounted notes in amounts ranging from $2,500 to $5,000, and then tucked the valuable bits of paper inside the inner band of his hat for safekeeping. Throughout his morning, as he bought more and more notes at a discount from these merchants, Goldman's hat sat higher and higher above his forehead. In this way, Goldman could keep score against the likes of his fellow ambitious Jewish bankers, Solomon Loeb, the Lehmans, and the Seligmans. The higher the hat on the forehead in the morning, the more business being done. In the afternoon, Goldman would make his way uptown to visit the commercial banks, Commercial Bank on Chambers Street, the Importers and Traders Bank on Warren Street, or the National Park Bank on John Street, where he would see a cashier, or perhaps the president, according to Birmingham, deferentially remove his hat, and they would begin to dicker about what price the bankers would pay for the notes Goldman had in his hat. The difference between the buying and selling, not unlike what his descendants would do with mortgage-backed securities 140 years or so later, would be Marcus Goldman's profits. Right away, according to Birmingham, Goldman was able to buy and sell some $5 million worth of this commercial paper a year. Assuming he could clear, say, five cents on every dollar, 
he may well have been making some $250,000 a year, a tidy sum indeed, in 1869. What a colorful little anecdote, and what a vivid image that is painted there of Marcus Goldman in the 1870s, his hat raising higher and higher on his forehead as he stuffs more and more commercial paper into the inner band, keeping score against his rival banksters in the quest for market dominance. And that is the type of colorful little anecdote that peppers the history of Goldman Sachs and peppers the narrative of money and power, how Goldman Sachs came to rule the world by William D. Cohan, which we were just listening to a clip of. I would recommend the book for researchers who want to know more about the history of Goldman Sachs with the caveat that this is a rather mainstreamy narrative that in the effort of adding nuance and bringing balance to the story of Goldman Sachs, I think overdoes it, overtips the scale, and becomes something of a an apo- apologia for Goldman Sachs. And I think that is revealed at certain key points in the narrative where, for example, Cohen writes, unfortunately, such and such event occurred, when he really means unfortunately for Goldman Sachs, such and such an event occurred, not unfortunately for humanity, uh, such and such an event occurred. But having said that, it does contain a lot of very valuable and important verifiable uh, information about the people and events that have shaped Goldman's history. And sometimes, whether meaning to or not, I think certain very interesting little nuggets of that history do slip through, even in a rather uh, rather mainstreamy, as I say, narrative like Cohan's. Like, for example... This little tale from the story of Sidney Weinberg, one of the one of the leading lights in the history of Goldman Sachs, one of the most important directors in the bank's history, who was in charge in the 1940s, not only of Goldman Sachs, but also was an assistant to the chair of the War Production Board during World War II. And here's an interesting little snippet that relates to his resignation from that post as assistant to the chairman of the War Production Board in 1943. Quote, After Independence Day 1943, Weinberg submitted his resignation to Nelson, effective August 1st. Without elaboration, Nelson told the New York Times that Weinberg resigned on the advice of physicians who have ordered him to obtain rest and medical treatment. He returned to New York and to his post at Goldman. Whether Weinberg was genuinely ill, or whether this was a cover to allow him to pursue his next assignment for the U.S. government, is not clear. On November 5, 1943, at the request of William J. Donovan, the New York lawyer and head of the Office of Strategic Services, Roosevelt approved the appointment of Weinberg to go to Russia openly as the representative of the OSS, assuming Mr. Weinberg can be persuaded to go. Roosevelt initialed Donovan's request, OK, FDR 11543, and returned the memo to Donovan. Even though Weinberg was Jewish and spoke no Russian, or so he had earlier claimed, this time he took on the assignment. What he did in the Soviet Union for the U.S. government, and how long he was there, is not known. The CIA, the successor to the OSS, did not respond to a Freedom of Information Act request seeking information about Weinberg's mission. One of his grandsons, Peter Weinberg, a former Goldman Sachs partner and the founder of Perella Weinberg, a boutique investment bank, was not aware of what his grandfather did in the Soviet Union during the war, or even that he had gone there. End quote. Well, okay, a director of Goldman Sachs has a tie to the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA, but you have to take it into context. It was the 40s, that was the war, there was the Soviet Union to worry about. I mean, it was just one little isolated event in Goldman Sachs history, right? Quote, In 1978, Lloyd Blankfein graduated from Harvard Law School and took up a job as an associate at Donovan Ledger, a small old line law firm founded in 1929 by William J. Wild Bill Donovan, who later formed the Office of Strategic Services during World War II and was known as the father of the CIA. He was the fellow who authorized Sidney Weinberg's espionage work in the Soviet Union during World War II. End quote. Hmm. Is that the same Lloyd Blankfein that is the current CEO and chairman of Goldman Sachs? That Lloyd Blankfein? Hmm, yes. Well, maybe it's just me, but I have a hunch that the exploration of the connection between the OSS and CIA and Goldman Sachs 
maybe a fruitful one for any intrepid researchers out there that want to follow up those leads. And as a further point on that uh, data trail, you might want to look at episode 232 of this podcast, where we exposed AIG and talked about the secret insurance agent men that connected Cornelius Starr to Wild Bill Donovan and connected AIG to the OSS. Another interesting example of that type of connection. But let's get back to the task at hand, namely describing what it is Goldman Sachs is, what it does, how it makes its money. I think we have to take a step back for a moment and look at Wall Street in general, the financial services that are provided on Wall Street by these investment banks and other institutions, where we have arrived at the point where, just as Goldman Sachs has become a synonym for evil, I think Wall Street generally has become a synonym for evil, and again, not without reason uh, in our current day and age. But that is not to say that everything these financial services companies does is inherently evil. They do provide a service to the market that has historically provided value to various companies. Connecting people with capital to people who are looking for capital is a valuable service. But uh, as always, the devil is in the details. This is a point that I think has been articulated quite well in a book called Chasing Goldman Sachs, How the Masters of the Universe Melted Wall Street Down and Why They'll Take Us to the Brink Again by Suzanne McGee. Quote, What we tend to think of as Wall Street, the stock market, the investment banks, and the newer entities such as hedge funds, is really only the visible tip of a much larger iceberg that is the entire financial system. Collectively, these institutions help ensure that capital continues to move throughout the rest of the money grid. Sometimes they do this by providing a market for participants to undertake basic buy or sell transactions. On other occasions, they negotiate or devise solutions to more complicated capital-related questions, such as helping a company go public or sell debt, a process known as underwriting, or working with it to establish and achieve the best price possible in a merger negotiation. That intermediary function is alive and well, most visibly at the New York Stock Exchange, which occupies not only the epicenter of Wall Street at the corner of Broad and Wall Streets, but the heart of its role as a financial utility. On its sprawling trading floor, traders go about their business in much the same way their earliest predecessors did in the naves of Amsterdam churches, executing the purchases of blocks of shares for their clients, who these days could include an individual trying to sell 100 shares of General Electric or Microsoft inherited from a grandparent, or a mutual fund manager trying to reduce his holdings in Amazon.com in order to buy a stake in Alibaba.com, a Chinese counterpart. Exchanges trading stocks, futures and options contracts as well as commodities remains one of the most heavily regulated parts of Wall Street because of the essential role they play in a large, geographically scattered and diverse community. Now this is the idea of Wall Street and financial services and investment banking that Goldman Sachs likes to hide behind in its current incarnation. This is the God's work that Lloyd Blankfein was referring to in that now infamous interview that he gave several years ago. This is Wall Street firms like Goldman Sachs as benevolent institutions that are providing much-needed services, underwriting IPOs or providing fixed services, fixed income, currency and commodities uh, services to, to companies. This is, this is a valuable uh, institution that provides a nexus between people with capital, people looking for capital. It's, it's an important part of the economy. And it represents a tiny fraction of of what Goldman Sachs does to make its money in the current day and age. Lloyd Blankfein told the Times of London, we're very important. We help companies to grow by helping them to raise capital. And that he was just a banker doing God's work. Now, the interview seemed to play better as comedy than PR. Despite collecting the highest salary on Wall Street at $68 million a year, Blankfein never forgets that he is, quote, a blue-collar guy. <laughs> I believe he is referring to the sapphire choker he wears on casual Fridays. Now, Blankfein took only a $9 million Excellent. bonus for 2009, much less than in recent years, despite record profits. As for a defensive finance, he elaborated under oath. Is what we do a lot for the economy isn't that visible as an investment bank. We help allocate capital, we raise, we, do, we put companies together, we launch new businesses. So that's how Goldman Sachs is supposedly making money. 
as a traditional investment bank? Well, not according to Nomi Prince. A former Goldman Sachs trading strategist, now a senior fellow at Demos, a progressive think tank. That classical investment banking function is, is a very small portion of their revenues. I think it's about 10% or so. so. So if he's doing God's work, he's only doing it at 10% capacity. Most of the rest, says Prince, is so-called proprietary trading for the firm's own account rather than its clients. They're a trading house. They're, 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 you know, they can talk about being an investment bank and um, doing God's work and, and helping you know, raise financing for companies and all and that. But in the scheme of things, they do very little of that. Another longtime Wall Street insider from the other side of the political spectrum agrees, though he doesn't disapprove. I think first you have to admit they are very smart, they are very capable, and they have a huge franchise in the global capital markets. David Stockman, that, President Reagan's budget director, went to Wall Street in the mid-80s. Uh, take their results that just came out in 2009. They had $45 billion of revenue, of which $35 billion was from equity and fixed income trading and commodities and currencies. Now that's 75 percent of their revenue was basically from trading. So when a Republican friend of mine used to be in the Treasury Department says that Goldman Sachs is a hedge fund masquerading as a bank, that's true? Absolutely true. And you could look it up, since Goldman's financial filings are public records. Only a tenth of its revenues came from investment banking last year, more than three-fourths from trading for its own account. Yes, the investment banking and financial services, 10% of Goldman Sachs revenue, the vast majority coming from proprietary trading, which is essentially insider trading. It's completely legal insider trading that they get away with, but it is insider trading. It is front-running. It is... Uh, it is certainly trading on advanced and inside knowledge, and that's how not only Goldman Sachs, but many of these investment banks now make their money, by trading against their own customers, if need be, which of course is really the heart of the issue when it comes to what happened during the subprime mortgage meltdown fiasco and how Goldman Sachs managed to make oodles of money, make record profits, even as its competitors were going down, because Goldman made use of various advanced knowledge, insider trading knowledge that it had, uh, and that it had from constructing these pieces of garbage, these toxic derivatives that it was then pawning off on its customers, let alone what it was hearing from its customers. Um, so the real question then is, how did that changeover occur? And that's a broad question that has all sorts of different factors uh, playing into it from sociological factors to economic factors to political factors. And I think that may be one of the most important pieces of the Goldman Sachs puzzle, how Goldman Sachs went from a, an investment bank that certainly had a notoriety and reputation on Wall Street in the past, but on Wall Street and was not a household name by any means before the 2008 crisis. How did it become a household name? Why is it that we now identify Goldman Sachs as a vampire squid? And it is in that other moniker by which we refer to Goldman Sachs in this day and age, government Sachs, that we can start to understand where that comes from. Because, of course, in the last two decades specifically, Goldman Sachs has infested every lever of financial power within the United States government. Let's just talk briefly about, about a couple of these appointments that have sort of raised uh, questions about that pledge that you have brought up as well as others. Uh, newly installed Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner appointed Mark Patterson, and this is a former top lobbyist for Goldman Sachs as his chief of staff. Is your chief of staff from Goldman Sachs? My chief of staff, uh, who is a... Just tell me, I don't have much time. But, but Congressman... My chief of staff did spend some time. Working, he worked for a Goldman brief Sachs. Time working in the past for Goldman Sachs. That's correct. okay. That's all I want to know. American presidential candidates, including Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush, are in the pocket of Wall Street's most successful bank. To Hillary first, her son-in-law is a former Goldman Sachs employee. He runs a hedge fund which received money from Goldman Sachs CEO. Well, Goldman Sachs has also reportedly donated one million to the Clinton Foundation. 
Let's go to Jeb Bush. His fundraising campaign was organized by Goldman Sachs Foundation head Dina Powell. And she just happened to serve in the White House under his brother, President George W. Bush. Jeb's fundraising advisor is also from Goldman Sachs. And uh, so many of the top officials in the Obama administration used to work for Goldman Sachs. And I've gone through the list. And Tim Geithner's former advisors were all... I wouldn't say all, but I'd say about 75% former Goldman Sachs or current Goldman Sachs employees. So they've got a Goldman Sachs mentality, and then, you know, you have very real consequences to that, uh, including the first people that basically get paid in all this bailout nonsense is Goldman Sachs. They get about $13 billion from AIG, and that $13 billion from AIG came from us, the United States taxpayers. Now, they get it as part of this naked derivative deal and it is very very arguable Elliot Spitzer has argued other smart people have argued and I've looked at the case, the facts itself that no way Goldman Sachs should have been paid a uh, hundred cents on the dollar there because AIG is bankrupt and while they're bankrupt to pay the most dubious of claims first to AIG for 13 billion dollars to me seems crazy and then if you're an actual progressive, you would have never allowed that, right? But who was the number one donor to Barack Obama during the election? Goldman Sachs. Bingo. Goldman Sachs. $989,000. That's incredible. When former European Commission President Jose Manuel Barroso announced he would be taking a job with the U.S. investment bank Goldman Sachs, the outrage and condemnation came hard and fast. Morally, politically, ethically, it is Mr. Barroso's mistake. It's the worst thing a former president of the European institution could do to the European project at a time in history when the union needs to be supported, carried, and reinforced. Barroso will be the chief lobbyist for Goldman Sachs International in Europe. But his shift into the private sector is consistent with a trend that's been around for decades. Alors, si je vous dis simplement quelques noms, Monsieur Romano Prodi, Senior Advisor International Goldman Sachs Italy, qui devient président de la Commission 99-2004. Monsieur Mario Monti, commissaire de la concurrence dans la même commission, qui est embauché en 2008 par Goldman Sachs. Monsieur Mario Draghi, vice-président Europe de Goldman Sachs entre 2002 et 2005, qui devient le président de la Banque Centrale Européenne. Uh, this is not a time right now to um, wishful thinking the government is going to sort things out. The government don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. Government Sachs is the heart of the problem. A Goldman Sachs, however wanton its criminality, could at least theoretically be contained. But when Goldman Sachs becomes government Sachs, i.e. when they take over the levers of centralized power that is inherent in government, well, who is going to stop it and how? This is not some airy-fairy theoretical problem. This is one that we are already dealing with and have been for some time. For example, in the 2007-2008 meltdown and the collapse of Lehman, we see the fingerprints of government Sachs. Insofar as, who got taken down in that hit? Bear Stearns, for example, which ended up getting bought out at $10 a share, was definitely one of the key losers of that era, and was not coincidentally on the hit list, not only of Goldman, but of other Wall Street firms that were holding a grudge against Bear Stearns in particular for having been the holdout uh, during the $3.6 billion bailout of the failed long-term capital management, LTCM, which, uh, which collapsed in 1998. Wall Street generally, Goldman in particular, bore a grudge against Bear Stearns, and they got taken out, and Lehman presented a key uh, competitor for Goldman Sachs in the thick sphere, and they ended up being blown up. But AIG, whom Goldman Sachs was heavily tied into through uh, credit default swaps, ends up getting taken over by the government in order to save it. Save this company, don't save that one. Who's making those decisions? Oh, that's right. Hank Paulson, ex-Goldmanite. Hmm, any connection? I wonder. So again, this is not theoretical. Government Sachs is a real thing. It has real consequences in the real world. And it's about the game for all the marbles, control of the economic sphere generally. And it is being accomplished.
But there is good news. One aspect of that good news is that at least people are starting to at least put a name to this this enemy, this 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 cancerous agent that has taken over more and more of the economy. People are starting to understand government sacks. That is a term that is in parlance. There are even groups that are trying trying to raise awareness of this problem. So that is to the good. People are starting to understand what government sacks is and that it is a problem at all, which is a significant step. But here's the even better news. Finally, we have had a political messiah from on high who is not bought and paid for by Goldman Sachs and who is going to drain that swamp. So the nice part about me is that I don't have any of that stuff. I don't have it. I'm putting up my own. I'm not I'm not into Goldman Sachs. I don't care about Goldman Sachs because what he wanted to do is say I will protect you from Goldman Sachs. I will t- protect you from Citibank and I will protect you for the banks because I'm Robin Hood and I'm this wonderful senator and I'm going to protect you for these banks. And then he's borrowing from the banks. And by the way, he's got personal guarantees and he got low interest loans, he got low interest loans, a low interest. And now he's going to go after Goldman Sachs. Doesn't work that way. Goldman Sachs owns him. Remember that, folks. They own him. And then he'll come and tell you about how he's going to protect you from the banks. Let me tell you, Goldman Sachs and Citibank have him totally under control, folks. Believe me. Okay, he may talk. But believe me, they have him 100% under control. Me, I'm not taking money, so it's very easy, okay? He talks about how he's going to get, well, Goldman Sachs. I know the guys at Goldman Sachs. They have total, total, total control over him. Just like they have total control over Hillary Clinton. They have total. But they have no control. They have no control over Donald Trump. Drain the swamp. We're going to drain the swamp of Washington. We're going to have fun doing it. We're all doing it together. It is funny. Wait, did he say drain the swamp or to fill the swamp as quickly as possible with as many members of Goldman Sachs as can possibly be stuffed into it? Today, the Trump administration announced its fifth straight high-profile hire from Goldman Sachs. Uh, Just keeping track, the senior strategist at the White House, Goldman Sachs, the nominee to be Treasury Secretary, Goldman Sachs, the head of the National Economic Council, the president of Goldman Sachs, the head of the SEC, which is the top cop that polices Wall Street firms like Goldman Sachs. That'll be a former lawyer for Goldman Sachs. Uh, And now today, some new advisor job they created at the White House will be going to another partner at Goldman Sachs. I'd like to get your thoughts on what we can tell so far about what Trump's relationship to the banking community is and what it might be as he tries to proceed with uh, his restructuring of the, the American economy. Yeah, I mean, it's very simple right now what his relationship is, because he has basically appointed a Treasury secretary who is a former partner at Goldman Sachs um, and as head of his um his economic counsel, the the former president of Goldman Sachs, Gary Cohn, um, who actually was my boss's boss when I was at, at Goldman Sachs. He was one of the uh, managing partners at the time of um, the FIC division, um, fixed income, currency and commodities. So the area that traded, the area that took risk. Um, and through that, he, he ultimately um, moved more up the firm into the president and number two spot at Goldman Sachs. Um, so it's very clear what Trump's current relationship is with Goldman Sachs, which is that he has the number two guy at Goldman Sachs um, coming in as, as a major policy advisor for both domestic and foreign policy. We've got Anthony Scaramucci, a former Goldman employee, employee who will now serve as a senior White House advisor, Dina Habib Powell who heads charitable efforts for the firm. She'll be a senior counselor for economic initiatives. And then we have the Daily News explaining that they'll join White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon, National Economic Council Chairman appointee Gary Cohn, and Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman nominee Jay Clayton as top Trump appointees who held senior Goldman positions. So this is a whole team. And I think the biggest point for me is, as you mentioned, had Clinton gotten into office, it would have been the same thing. Barack Obama did the same thing. Had Mitt Romney or John McCain won either of those years, it would have been the same thing. Because Goldman Sachs has been lining all of their pockets. And it's just, in my opinion, an insurance policy plan to make sure that no matter what happens, they have some semblance or some degree of control over governance, which 
um, as I learned from your documentary on the Federal Reserve, is even more shocking to me because they already have control of the money supply. So the fact that they still need to go and they still want to be regulating and to be controlling the government itself, which they already control through the Fed, is just mind boggling and as much total control as I could imagine of the financial sector. Make America Goldman again. Yes, it may be a little premature to start the plans to dance on the grave of government sacks. Something tells me it's going to be around for at least another four to eight years, or potentially much longer than that. And in the meantime, what do we get to be treated to on the nightly news other than former president and CEO of Goldman Sachs and current chief economic advisor to the Trump administration, Gary Cohn, telling us how great the Federal Reserve is, what a wonderful job it's doing, and how much we should respect its power. Well, let me ask you about something that perhaps you're not so excited about. The Federal Reserve is almost certain to raise interest rates when they meet uh, this week. Uh, are you worried, <clears throat> excuse me, are you worried that if there is a series of rate hikes over this year and early next year, that that could hinder economic growth? Look, Chris, the, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency and, and they operate as such. They have their economic data, which they look at, and they are trying to always modulate, you know, economic growth with inflation, with the workforce. And I think the Federal Reserve, Reserve has been doing a, a, a good job in doing that. The Fed will do what they need to do, and we respect the powers of the Fed. A bile-inducing sight, to be sure, and one that we are going to be treated to at some length over the coming years, no end in sight. And that is really the question. What do we do about government sacks? That question cannot be separated from the more fundamental question of what do we do about government? Because it is not some happenstance of history. It isn't some mere contingency that the bankster billionaires who control the money supply have somehow or other ended up taking control of these centralized institutions of power, these regulatory agencies and other levers and instruments of, of power that uh, seek to steward over the economy. No, those centralized locations of power have been put into place by the corporate cronies who want to control that. That is why the system exists as it exists. It is not separable. Government is not separable from the corporate cronies that control government. Uh, that is what the criminals want. They want to have something like government with its imprimatur that gives legitimacy to anything that it, it puts its stamp on to give legitimacy to, for example, the Federal Reserve so that the private banking cartel can overtly rule over the banking system in a very explicit way that no one even thinks to question because that's the way it is. So the real question here is what do we do about government itself? And that's a question that goes to the root of all the issues that we talk about here on the Corbett Report and the mental enslavement uh, that has permeated uh, American society, let alone every other society on the globe, uh, for generations, centuries, millennia. And I don't say that lightly. I think we have to understand that the banking system, for example, is predicated on the monetary system. Everyone takes it for granted. Of course, in the U.S. context, it's the Federal Reserve notes, the U.S. dollar that is the currency. But why is it the currency? Well, of course, there are legal tender laws that mandate the taking of U.S. dollars for any uh, obligation. But more fundamentally, of course, it's the taxation system itself, the theft system itself. If we're speaking honestly, taxation is theft, but taxation isn't to pay for government services. I don't know why people believe that taxation is necessary for the payment of government services, specifically in the U.S. context, where, of course, the U.S. Treasury can has and does print as many zeros on the end of its debt obligations as it wants and people continue to buy them up, it isn't taxation that fundamentally uh, is used to pay for government services. It's debt that is created by the treasury out of nothing that is used, or more accurately created by the private banks out of nothing and given to the treasury, that is uh, that uh, pays for government services. Taxation is meant to validate the monetary system itself. So that is one of the fundamental underlying layers of the banking system, which is constructed on top of that. And then we get something like government sacks emerging from that. There are multiple layers to this. 
And I don't think, unfortunately, that there is a silver bullet solution that's going to pierce the heart of this particular werewolf and end the nightmare for us all in one swift blow. It is the question, as always, of what we can actually do to try to extricate ourselves from this system that has been built around us, before us even, uh, that we have been born into. And that, again, is no... There is no silver bullet. There is no uh, wooden stake that we can drive through the heart of the vampire all at once. It is a question. It is a long and slow process of finding those ways that we can start to take our control back and start to not destroy the system, but to build our own system, to build our own alternative structures. So this is manifested in multiple different ways. For example, the various drives that have occurred in the last few years to try to get people, at the very least, to take their money, their personal savings out of the big banks and to put them into community uh, credit systems and and, uh, alternative uh, banking structures so that they can, at the very least, stop funding the beast that is enslaving them. That might be a good start. And, of course, this applies to every other level and facet of what it is that we do. If we are participating in local complementary currencies and community projects and trying to find and source local uh, sources of food and constructing all of the various parts of this puzzle that are now increasingly possible. It is possible to imagine a world without banking middlemen being in the middle of all of our transactions if we can transact directly with each other through various means. It can be done, and technologically speaking, it's probably easier than ever. But it is the part of flipping the mental switch from this is the system we're in, this is what exists, and we have to deal with it, to we can actually do something different. And it's going to be a long and slow and difficult process that's going to involve every bit as much effort as the banksters and their cronies put into constructing the current enslavement grid. We are going to have to put into constructing a freedom grid. Uh, It's not an easy process. So the answer to the government sex problem, unfortunately, is not more government, more regulation. If we just if we just continue slapping more regulation on, it will always go great. Just like Sarbanes-Oxley was going to end all of the Wall Street frauds, right? Oh, wait, the compliance software that the SEC mandated for Sarbanes-Oxley had backdoors built into it? And they knew about this because whistleblowers came to them and told them that there is backdoors built into this compliance software. And the SEC tried to shut those whistleblowers up and continued using the compliance software that they knew had backdoors engineered into it to allow the fraud that they were supposedly trying to regulate out of existence. Hmm, it's almost as if the system is fundamentally rigged. Who would have thought it? No, more government regulation is not the the answer to this problem, it's going to require a much, much more thorough and wholesale answer that will involve the participation of all of us. The first step is to know the enemy. The second step is to start constructing the alternatives so that we don't have to deal with the enemy. That second step is something that I've been talking about in my solution series over the years, and I've talked about in many different aspects and will continue to talk about. But knowing the enemy, of course, is another important part of that. And I hope that this introduction, really, to Goldman Sachs is evil, Goldman Sachs is the vampire squid, will help you to at least begin that research. But as always, I will leave you to continue the task of researching this very important and very, very comprehensive topic of not just... Goldman Sachs, not just government Sachs, but Wall Street generally and how it functions in our current economy. Of course, I have just laid out some of the breadcrumbs along that trail, but there is much more to explore, and I wholeheartedly encourage you to explore that for yourself and to report back to headquarters if you are so inclined. I'm always interested to hear about what your own research brings up in relation to these matters. But we're going to end this episode of The Corbett Report here. I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again real soon. Goldman Sachs is just plain evil. They are evil as can be. Goldman Sachs makes their own laws. They fear no penitentiary. When somebody runs for office, they say, hey, what is your fee? Goldman Sachs is... The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, 
and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com slash support. The views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of Goldman Sachs, and Goldman Sachs is not providing any financial, economic, legal, accounting, or tax advice or recommendations in this podcast. In addition, the receipt of this podcast by any listener is not to be taken as constituting the giving of investment advice by Goldman Sachs to that listener.